Is this is this working? Can you hear me? Oh, yay! Um, so, welcome to our fall speaker series. I'm so happy that all of you are here this evening. Um, Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Susan Leith. I'm the uh, president of the Bethlehem Historical Association, and we partner with the library to present these wonderful series of talks. Um, and just a couple of announcements before we get going. Um, I want to make sure that you all know that the Museum of the Bethlehem Historical Association at the Cedar Hill Schoolhouse is open Sunday afternoons from 2 to 4 p.m., only till the end of October. So if you want to get there this fall, go Sunday or the next Sunday. It's, it's got some interesting displays for this season. So I hope you do that. And then we, like I said, we really appreciate our partnership with the library to present these talks. We've got a couple more coming up um, this fall. October will be Jill Knapp talking about the upstate New York tenant farmers rebellion. That's the anti-rent wars. It's going to be a good one. And then November, John Wexler talks about the land between the Waterfalls, which is documenting five centuries of indigenous land use in the town of Bethlehem and in the area. And you can find more information on our website, BethlehemHistorical.org. I also, if you're here in person, you have a handy little flyer that the library made up that's on the table out there. It also has all our talks for the spring as well. So I invite you to do that and hope that you uh, come down to the museum and check us out. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Stuart Lehman. Uh, Stuart has worked at a number of historic sites, including Schuyler Mansion in Albany, Herkimer Home in Little Falls, and Senate House in Kingston. Currently, he develops programs and conducts research related to New York State Capitol. On weekends, he participates in Revolutionary War reenactments as a colonial doctor. He lives in Gilderland, New York, with his wife and six cats. I'm I only have two. I would love to have six. Uh, <laughs> he recently started collecting historic stereo views for the insights they give into 19th century life and for their often unique views of long lost places and spaces. Without further ado, Mr. Lehman. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And um, I hope you don't mind if I uh, have a couple of uh, announcements uh, myself. Uh, of course, I work at the New York State Capitol. And uh, our uh, capital haunting tours are starting uh, uh, very shortly, actually October 4th. Uh, this year, they're going to be evenings at uh, um, uh, 5 o'clock and uh, 6 o'clock. Um, go online very quickly, though, because they are uh, reserved and uh, they do uh, fill up very quickly. But, uh, of course, they'll be uh, going through uh, October uh, 31st couple of uh, events that are uh, uh, interesting ones not to uh, not to be missed uh, this Saturday the uh, 23rd it's nothing to do with the capital but um, uh, Eastfield Village is having their uh, founders uh, day across the river uh, if you haven't been to Eastfield Village uh, before it's well worth a visit it's a collection of uh, early 19th century houses and buildings that have been gathered together um, and it's a little like that old movie Brigadoon uh, where it comes to life once every hundred years of course uh, Eastfield Village is a little bit better because it comes to life once uh, every year but uh, 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 unless you take one of their courses there it's really the only way you get a chance to uh, take a look and uh, uh, and see that. Uh, uh, another event on uh, the Stereo View Collection is going to feature in it um, is going to be at uh, Grant Cottage uh, the Saturday following on the uh, 30th. Uh, I guess they're calling it Fall for All, uh, but it's mostly going to uh, be about uh, Victorian uh, technology. Uh, and from what I understand, they're trying to have, do a little bit of steampunk with that. So you'll go up and learn about photography and uh, uh, quite a few other uh, other things. So that's uh, on the 30th uh, from uh, 9.30. 9.30 to 4, uh, 4 o'clock. Now, with that out of the way, I want to get to uh, stereo views. Uh, Lately, there's been lots of talk about virtual reality. Uh, there uh, are literally um, hundreds of companies in Silicon Valley and elsewhere that are developing all these uh, high-tech uh, uh, examples of virtual reality. Uh, 
Ruth and I were, uh, a few months ago, we went to the Van Gogh exhibit out in Schenectady, the immersive exhibit, and we got a chance to try on virtual reality, put on the goggles, and get whisked through this uh, 19th century uh, French village that looked just like it came out of a Van Gogh uh, painting. Uh, a very uh, fascinating uh, way to go about it. But virtual reality really isn't so much a new thing, even though the term virtual reality is. Um, people in the 19th century had their own form of virtual reality, uh, their own way of imagining that they were in a particular uh, spot, their own way of exper experiencing it, and that was uh, through, the, uh, through the stereoscope. Now, um, if you're lucky, uh, you may have uh, grown up in a house with a nice attic on it or had a grandmother's house where you could go um, uh, and uh, you might have found a um, found one of these uh, con contraptions and boxes and boxes uh, of these, uh, of, of these um, uh, slides. If you don't have a, a grandmother's attic to go to, uh, to look for them, uh, you can just go to almost any antique shop and you'll find uh, boxes and boxes of these, uh, of these to go through. So they're still out there, they're still, uh, still around. For about 70 years, this, the um, uh, stereoscope and the uh, cards were essentially as ubiquitous as, um, uh, as a television set is today. Uh, uh, almost any house that uh, was of moderate means or above uh, could, uh, uh, could afford them. And uh, many spent a uh, while away their Sunday afternoons after church in the parlor uh, going through boxes and boxes of these cards and imagining, uh, uh, imagining they were anywhere around the world. Now, in 1922, when the stereo cards were kind of falling out of fashion, uh, Norman Rockwell uh, had some fun with them by this uh, cover for uh, this, uh, the um, uh, Saturday Evening Post. It was showing a young, uh, young man uh, uh, learning from one of, these, uh, one of the stereo cards. But I think um, Norman Rockwell was playing a little trick on his uh, editor. Uh, I don't think, from the expression on this young man's uh, face, that he is looking at a picture of a dry old Egyptian monument. I think that he would more likely be looking at a card like this, <laughs> which is your 1902 version of uh, the swimsuit edition. Uh, some of the cards were a little uh, risque, a few of them more than this one. Now, to really understand what was going on with the stereoscope, you have to um, go back and uh, see how the technology together act, or developed. Uh, actually, there were a number of different technologies that all kind of came together at the same time to, um, uh, to create this. Uh, many things were happening, uh, happening at once, and uh, uh, as many technologies do, that happened, uh, per, uh, happened especially uh, quickly. Uh, of course, uh, if you were going to have uh, uh, photographs on your uh, stereoscope, photographs need to be invented. And that's what happened in the early 19th century. The very first uh, successful um, style of photography to hit the public uh, was the daguerreotype. The daguerreotype um, uh, was invented in France, uh, but its inventors, uh, with a little help from the French government, decided not to patent it, not to try and keep a hold of it. They published the uh, recipe books and so forth, so very quickly it spread throughout the wor world. By the next year, even though it was invented in 1839, in 1840, um, uh, Samuel uh, F.B. Morse had brought uh, the information and the plans over to the New World and was teaching uh, daguerreotype, uh, how to make daguerreotypes. 
The garotypes had a few problems with them that were later um, uh, later uh, fixed. Initially, as uh, you've often heard, they took a long time to um, uh, to uh, be exposed, so people had to stay there and uh, stay still for uh, long periods of time. In fact, the very first daguerreotypes uh, uh, were considered uh, not. Um, not appropriate for portraits because they took 20 minutes to um, uh, uh, to capture the image. Uh, there is a case of one young gentleman who uh, must have had a lot of self-control who sat there <laughs> for the full 20 minutes and got his portrait taken. But the very earliest ones were mostly uh, used for uh, architecture and things that didn't move. But once you have a popular thing like this, and once you have entrepreneurs uh, throughout uh, two continents, and then eventually more, uh, doing their best to improve it, uh, things improved very, uh, very quickly. They came up uh, um, uh, with uh, other mixtures and other uh, techniques, and uh, soon, uh, by the end of the daguerreotype uh, period, it would only be a minute or so to uh, that you had to sit there for the um, uh, uh, for the uh, for the exposure. The daguerreotype had some other problems. Uh, one is that uh, well, it's the, the daguerreotype is uses a um, a, uh, a silver coated piece of copper that has to be polished to an incredible shine um, or the texture will make it uh, very uh, uninteresting. Uh, so it takes a lot of work to make it. Uh, both the iodine vapor and mercury vapor are used in part of the uh, process, so not particularly healthy, uh, uh, healthy for the photographer. Uh, but for the uh, public uh, who was interested in getting their picture done, one of the um, uh, most inconvenient things about it is that it was a one-off. Uh, you took one picture and that was done. If you wanted a copy, you had to take another picture. Or you had to take a photograph of the photograph, which of course, every time you do that, you're going to lose uh, some, of the, uh, some of the sharpness. So essentially, uh, you had one of those or maybe two of them made, and uh, uh, and that was uh, that was it at the at the time. A few years later, on the 1850s, uh, they developed a couple of other techniques, um, and many of the pictures that you find in those little cases are not daguerreotypes, but uh, what's referred to as an ambrotype. Uh, they're uh, a negative that was made on a piece of glass by a chemical called colliden, uh, which is uh, sometimes referred to as gun cotton. Uh, also took a lot of work and even some cyanide vapor to get it uh, uh, to, uh, to get the image to come out correctly. Um, they uh, uh, were often uh, reversed, although you could uh, uh, use a mirror to uh, switch, them, uh, switch them the right way. Um, and being on glass made them uh, uh, quite a bit, um, uh, quite fragile. So not the sort of thing you want to send in the mail. Not long after, uh, they came up with another process, and you'll often find these in boxes in grandmother's attic, uh, called the tintype. And the tintype used an iron plate uh, that was coated with a black lacquer. Um, and uh, it was very popular, especially around the time of the Civil War. You could send it in the mail. Uh, you could carry it with you on the battlefield. And uh, unless it got hit by a mini ball, uh, it was, uh, was incredibly uh, durable. Uh, even though other types of pho uh, photography eventually replaced it, uh, they were still popular at fairs and amusement parks and so forth. Uh, and I've talked to people right up into the 1950s. We'd go out uh, 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 for a day uh, at some kind of an attraction and have their tintype made. So uh, they never, uh, never completely, uh, completely went away. The glass plate uh, collide in positive, or the ambrotype, eventually led to something that was a, a much greater improvement in, um, uh, in photography. They used the same chemicals to make a glass plate negative. 
Um, and by the negative took a lot of effort to make. Uh, it had to be made right away, uh, had to be covered right away uh, uh, or, uh, with the material before you exposed it. Then it had to be developed uh, right away. Uh, but once you had that glass plate negative, you could print as many photographs as you wanted um, out of it. So it was a vast, uh, vast improvement that essentially came out of the um, uh, out of the amber uh, amber type. Uh, um, at the same time, another very important uh, um, development was well. I didn't mean that to be a pun, but I guess it is. Another important development uh, was the uh, use of uh, or photographic uh, paper. And the first really effective pho uh, photogra uh, photographic paper is called albumin paper. Um, it's very thin, uh, uh, thin paper, right out of linen and cotton. Um, and uh, the albumin, of course, uh, it refers to the egg white that's uh, used in it. And it creates a very nice, uh, a little bit of sepia toning, but uh, uh, a very nice uh, uh, clear, uh, clear image. So now, instead of having that uh, 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 leather case or a piece of metal or a piece of highly polished silver, uh, you could uh, take that paper and mount it on a card. Uh, that led to one of the first crazes in photography uh, was the uh, CDV. You essentially, uh, they um, uh, used cameras that often could take uh, multiple images, maybe eight to ten ima in images at a time. Um, and of course, uh, once you had the negatives, you could keep printing them up. Uh, People at the time would often, when they visited, would leave a calling card with their name behind. Well, why not leave a calling card with your picture behind? Uh, you could get these by the dozen, and uh, you could hand them out to all your friends and relatives, and they would put it in their albums. Uh, of course, uh, people didn't stop there. Once they put their own friends and relatives in their albums, uh, they uh, got interested in um, celebrities. So CDVs were made with uh, uh, everybody you can imagine. In this case is uh, uh, Queen Victoria, uh, but uh, Abraham Lincoln or um, uh, actors, actresses, uh, ministers, uh, anybody who was anybody back then had uh, uh, CDVs. Uh, Photographers like Matthew Brady and others, whenever they had a celebrity come to their shop for a photograph, uh, they would uh, pull out all the stops, uh, make him some tea, um, uh, have them come in and sit, and they would take their picture for free, uh, give them a number of copies, but on the understanding that they could take that negative and uh, uh, make a lot of money uh, selling copies of that, uh, that picture. So a lot of people uh, were um, uh, were recorded because of, uh, because of that. And because it was so uh, inexpensive, um, uh, you could get at least 12 for a dollar and sometimes uh, uh, even less. Uh, just about everybody could have, uh, uh, have a CDV uh, made, not just Queen Victoria, but uh, you have people who seem to have a lot less money than Queen Victoria. Uh, and even someone, I'm uh, not quite sure what her profession is, but I can kind of guess. <laughs> so uh, CDVs really, uh, really uh, hit the world by, by storm in the 1850s, and especially during, uh, during the Civil War. You'll often find uh, albums of these uh, CDVs in people's attic and antique, uh, antique stores. A bit later, uh, 1870s and particularly in the 1880s, as lenses improved, as uh, uh, paper improved and so forth, uh, they began to make uh, larger photographs that actually captured, uh, captured more de detail. Uh, these were the uh, cabinet cards, which are uh, essentially like four, uh, three and a half by six or so. Um, and you'll also find uh, albums and boxes and boxes of these. Unfortunately, people generally didn't put their names on them. Uh, so if you go to an antique store, you'll find boxes and boxes of unidentified uh, pictures like this. Uh, one dealer, um, uh, even a clever dealer, put a, a, a sign up saying, um, 
uh, create your own family tree. <laughs> uh, this, uh, th these, uh, whoop, let me go back. Um, this one is actually known. That's my uh, great grandfather, David Snook, who was a blacksmith out in uh, uh, East Skodak. Uh, I don't know who these ladies were, but they are preparing for a day of hiking out in Watkins Glen. Uh, there were photographers that uh, uh, set up at important tourist areas and uh, uh, took your picture uh, for you. Uh, just imagine clambering over all these rocks and uh, waterfalls and so forth uh, in this uh, clothing. It had to be pretty intrepid for that. Now, we've gotten the photography uh, available. Uh, the next step has to be to uh, figure out the, um, uh, uh, figure out the uh, uh, basis behind uh, stereoscopy. Uh, and it's uh, pretty basic. Uh, people uh, are, um, uh, it's essentially how people get around. Your uh, mind takes two, or your eyes take two slightly different images and mix them together in your brain and you see a three-dimensional. There are other cues like shading and light and so forth that can be used so that people who have a problem with one eye can still uh, get around, they get used to it, but uh, stereoscopic vision is really something that uh, we all, or most of us, uh, benefit from it. Um, but it wasn't until uh, the 19th century that people began to figure out what it was all about. And one of those uh, people was Sir Charles Wheatstone. Uh, he was the one who first described the principle of uh, stereoscopy. And he developed a, a little bit of a, a trick so he could demonstrate it. He took a couple of drawings of geometrical devices, uh, put them on either side of this uh, uh, this uh, contraption. Uh, there were mirrors and a prism uh, involved in that, and if you looked at it just the right way, uh, you got that uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, picture from, uh, from the drawing. Uh, uh, interesting, especially if you're of a scientific bent, uh, um, nice for a classroom, but not the sort of thing that the general public is going to uh, be that interested in for, uh, uh, for recreation. That didn't come about until the next uh, scientist, Sir David Brewster, who was world famous for his research in optics. Uh, he's also the person who invented the kaleidoscope. Uh, he came up with the very first practical stereo viewer um, and uh, eventually as well the very first um, stereo camera. The stereo camera had two uh, lenses. Um, they were close together. They're about two and a half inches apart, which is the uh, distance between a person's pupils. Uh, so they would take two uh, almost identical pictures from a slightly different um, uh, a s slightly different angle, and when you looked at them uh, um, uh, through or uh, separately with each eye, uh, if you did it just right, uh, you got that uh, three-dimensional effect. Uh, his uh, stereo viewer uh, worked, but it needed light from behind, so generally was used mostly with. Um, uh, uh, with tissue cards and glass, uh, uh, glass c uh, card views. It was clunky, it was expensive, uh, but it uh, uh, definitely got, uh, got things started. Um, still uh, was pretty much a novelty until a few other things happened. And one of those has to do with perhaps the greatest social media influencer of the 19th century, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, uh, everybody wanted to do what uh, Queen Victoria and her family did. Uh, she's the reason why people wear white wedding dresses, why we have Christmas trees in our house. Uh, she and her family did a lot. Um, and, um, uh, her uh, uh, husband, uh, Prince Albert, was a leading figure behind the um, Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851, where all sorts of new technologies from around the world uh, were brought uh, were brought forward. Photography was a big um, um, 
a big exhibit there. Uh, Queen Victoria was an early adopter of photography. She uh, loved taking pictures and having pictures made of her and the royal family. Uh, they were great for propaganda purposes to show how um, uh, how um, uh, nice and genteel uh, the royal family uh, family was. Um, she was. Uh, a good thing she doesn't know what the uh, what photography uh, does with the royal family uh, family today. They have quite a few scandals related to to photographs, but it was a bit of a simpler time. And of course, one of the things that Queen Victoria discovered at this uh, Crystal Palace expedition exhibition was David Brewster's stereo photography. At the time, it was basically using daguerreotypes and uh, um, uh, and so and paper salt prints, but it was still uh, a very astounding uh, thing, and Vic Queen Victoria loved it. Uh, she made sure people knew, she collected uh, stereo views, and within a few years, by uh, 1860, uh, in England, uh, the London Stereoscopic Con uh, Company had uh, over 10,000 uh, cards uh, in, their, uh, in their card catalog. It spread uh, extremely, extremely quickly, especially when uh, the um, album paper uh, uh, cards were uh, uh, begun, had begun to be used. Now, how is it going to do on this side of the, uh, of the Atlantic? Well, uh, there we have to uh, thank another important social media uh, influencer, Al Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. Uh, he was a, a, a doctor uh, and um, as a doctor, he was a bit of a nut. He came up with some very, or uh, supported some very strange and radical ideas. Um, it's hard to believe, but uh, he actually promoted the idea that doctors should wash their hands before and after they treated patients. Can you imagine anything quite as uh, ridiculous as, as that? Uh, he didn't uh, invent that idea, but he did uh, uh, did uh, promote it. Uh, he also believed that uh, uh, many of the medicines of the day were bad for you, especially mercury, arsenic, and antimony. Um, can you imagine somebody uh, uh, opposing some of the most uh, prominent, important, and popular medicines of the day. He famously said that if all the materia medica as uh, used in the United States today were dumped into the ocean, it would be so much the best, uh, better for mankind and so much the worse for the fishes. So he had some rather unusual medical ideas, but he also, through his uh, articles in the Atlantic magazine, where he's referred to as the autocrat of the breakfast table, was a uh, a promoter of photography. He wrote several incredible articles or, uh, right at the beginning when photography began uh, uh, spreading uh, about uh, how uh, wonderful that they had captured the light of the uh, light of the sun. And when stereo views came out, he also waxed poetic about it. And his articles were very influential. They did um, uh, get people to go out and try it and popularize it. But at first, they would have found that clunky, old, hard-to-use Brewster stereo view. So Oliver Wendell Holmes did something else that really uh, set uh, stereo, uh, uh, stereo um, uh, photography on a, um, oh, on a course to popularity. He invented, with a local craftsman by the name of Bates, he invented, whoop, you just got to go back. Um, a cheaper and better uh, stereo view. Um, very easy to make. And uh, to use a modern day term, he chose to open source it. He refused to patent it. He wanted everybody who, who wanted to, to make it and uh, to sell it. So uh, these uh, proliferated. Um, uh, any toy maker, any uh, little cabinet shop could easily make, uh, make something like this. So uh, the, these uh, were incredibly inexpensive. 
Um, where was I? Oop. Um, and these, uh, you could find them for 50 cents. Uh, sometimes they were given away free with your, uh, uh, free with your subscription and to getting a, a box of uh, stereo views. Uh, they were all over the place and they still are. You can find them in any antique shop and in, in most people's, uh, uh, most people's um, uh, the attics uh, these, uh, these days. Um, and uh, as uh, these proliferated, uh, they became extremely popular, both uh, with photographers who loved to make a lot of money off of them, uh, and the people in general. Here is some wonderful quotes. One by Oliver Wendell, Holt, uh, Wendell Holmes himself, with a stereoscope by our fireside. On a winter's evening, we can walk through the sunny vineyards of Italy from our armchair, look down upon Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. We can wander through the cities of foreign lands, look upon their wonders of architecture, or follow the footsteps of our Savior along the banks of the Sea of Galilee. And again, another uh, photographer, uh, William M. Chase, uh, with a stereoscope by the fireside, one can walk through strange cities over bleak mountains and sunny valleys. There is many beauties lurking in a stereograph as there are flowers that blush unseen in the meadows. The three-dimensional was considered much better than just a book of photographs or a book of uh, engravings of uh, uh, exotic lands because you could really feel, you could uh, feel yourself right there and feel you were experiencing that particular, um, that particular um, area. If I could ask a question about sure. that. Sure. Uh, stereoscopic view department. That's from the uh, Sears and Roebuck catalog, I think from 1908. Um, and they sold, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of boxes of that. This is a little bit late in the period uh, where uh, stereo uh, views had changed a little bit. Um, but uh, um, they, uh, Sears even published a whole stereoscopic set of uh, pictures of their entire uh, mailing operation and warehouses, and of course the first one was the uh, uh, was their uh, CEO himself at his desk introducing you to the great uh, Sears uh, uh, Sears uh, company. So um, you could the, 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 all you had to do was get a catalog, and you could open open yourself to the whole whole world, any subject that. Uh, uh, that you uh, that you wanted, but that's getting a little bit later. Um, at the time, you had uh, the the time shortly after that, shortly after the 1860s and 70s, is often referred to as the golden era of stereo views. Uh, you had some wonderful photographers going around. You had great. Uh, um, uh, uh, you had some uh, uh, oh excellent uh, technology. And many of the people are just in the general local area, going around taking uh, pictures for uh, uh, their friends and relatives, taking it for other people who might uh, come and travel and visit uh, that area, sometimes selling their negatives to large companies like uh, E.A. Anthony's in uh, New York City to go into their things. So you have a lot of things that are uh, actually documented. Many of these uh, uh, initial photographers were actually extremely artistic. Um, if you love um, Hudson River School paintings, uh, I'm sure you've uh, heard of uh, Albert Bierstadt. I think one of his paintings recently went for several million dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Well, Albert Bierstadt with his brothers got started in art with uh, stereo views. Only he's the one who went off uh, to uh, fame as a painter. Uh, his brothers, kept up uh, businesses as stereo uh, photographers and probably ended up making more money in their lifetimes. Uh, Charles Bierstadt uh, actually, uh, after traveling uh, throughout the West, ended up settling uh, near Niagara Falls and was one of the many photographers that um, uh, sold their uh, views to the many tourists who came there so they could bring them home and show their neighbors where, uh, where they uh, had been. Um, and um, actually, a, 
was one of my first and one of my favorite stereo views because uh, of it being by Bierstadt, being a landscape. I can tell my uh, art history friends that I have an original 19th century Bierstadt landscape and I paid two dollars for it. <laughs> so. And uh, like I said, the, uh, it, um, uh, there are a lot of local people doing that. This is a very early picture in the eight, early 1860s. You can sometimes date them just by the uh, shape of the image, the color of the card, uh, and so forth. This one is uh, not marked, although um, uh, a photographer by the name of Rensselaer Churchill was uh, active in that area, so this might be, might be one of his. But this is a very early view of, um, uh, of State Street Hill, so uh, uh, interesting documentary. Um, we'll get to some more of those local photographs, but then the next event that really rocketed photography uh, into the mainstream, especially stereo views, of course, was the Civil War. Uh, photographers, uh, their main role during the war was, of course, uh, taking pictures of uh, the soldiers. Um, uh, that literally tens of thousands of them had their picture done as a tintype or a CDV uh, before they went out to, off to war. Uh, it's a good thing too because uh, uh, many of them never, got, never came back, so at least their families had something uh, to remember them by. But uh, many photographers, uh, including uh, William Brady, or Matthew Brady, um, uh, Alexander Gardner, Timothy L. Sullivan, and a number of very uh, great photographers uh, went out and uh, um, uh, documented uh, documented the, the conflict. Uh, there were literally um, uh, thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, pictures made as documents, and the majority of those were actually stereo views because that's what uh, what would sell. Uh, the Civil War, of course, uh, even long after remained a topic for stereo views, but you can see here, one of the things I love about stereo views is that it shows what people were thinking and what, uh, uh, what life was like at that particular time. You can see this great difference between um, the gritty reality taken during the war, this is a uh, 1864 image, um, it's from the Brady studio, although Brady didn't take most of the pictures that are attributed to him. Um, this is a um, much later, probably around 1900, 1902. And you can see how the war has changed in people's mind from this uh, horrible carnage of soldiers. Most of these died of disease. This is near a hospital near Fredericksburg. Uh, a terrible, everyday, uh, gritty reality of, uh, of the conflict itself that the people were experiencing to now, 1900, uh, this bucolic park here in Gettysburg with uh, a family in there, uh, Surrey with a fringe on top enjoying a picnic and this old veteran contemplating what had happened um, Oh, uh, almost half a century, uh, a century before. So you can see how it gives you an idea of what how the attitudes had uh, had changed uh, over time. And of course, at the end of the war, a uh, terrible event that everybody uh, um, uh, commemorated. It was also uh, captured in quite a number of stereo views. Uh, this is one by um, Rensselaer E. Churchill, a local Albany photographer. This is State Street Hill decorated for the procession of Lincoln's body up to the New York State Capitol where he lay in state on April 25th and 26th of 1865. So these stereo views helped to capture that, uh, that moment in time of a nation's mourning. Now, I mentioned before how when they started out, they had a really uh, long exposure time, so you had to sit there for hours and hours. But uh, uh, a lot of these uh, entrepreneurs and companies were learning how to make better lenses, how to make uh, um, uh, faster shutters, how to make um, uh, emulsions for their negatives that uh, could pick up, uh, uh, pick up light 
much more quickly. Uh, and even by the late 1860s, you had some people doing some incredible work. Uh, e -A and H T Anthony and Company were the biggest supplier of uh, stereo uh, or photography equipment in the country. Some places say that it was probably the biggest uh, supplier in the world. They had a huge catalog of stereo views and they were famous for their instantaneous views. So here we have in the mid to late 1860s, somebody taking a picture with such a fast shutter that they're able to catch the movement of the water. Uh, if you had a slow shutter speed, that would just be a blur. But they were actually coming up with some great, uh, uh, great technologies. Uh, here's uh, one published, I don't know if he took it, but one published by, um, oh, um, uh, Haynes, I'm forgetting his first name at this point, but he was very important. Um, uh, uh, oh, uh, Albany photographer. He took a lot of pictures of the New York State Capitol. Uh, and here he is showing a picture taken inside in I an ice cave in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and he's also mentioning, and this may uh, be how he got such good pictures of the interior of the Capitol, um, he's mentioning how uh, he can do interiors by magnesium light. So they were really learning and technology was improving. Uh, and very and great. Now, when you get to the in that golden age, if you look around for some of these wonderful pictures, they really show great uh, scenes of what life was like back then. Maybe a little bit idyllic, but uh, that's uh, that's part of the reality as well. Uh, Aaron Veeder, perhaps the best known Albany photographer from that time, took lots of the Capitol images um, and uh, around the uh, uh, around the area. And I love these pictures because uh, you can just imagine yourself in those scenes. Imagine early morning on a street in Albany before anybody has gotten up. No tracks, no wagons, uh, just this beautiful new fall and uh, snow. You could almost hear, uh, uh, listen to the hush of, the, uh, of, of, a, of a new uh, day, a beautiful winter day. I'd imagine going to Washington Park, uh, watching a group of children have the, or, uh, having a croquet game on the uh, uh, on this beautiful new uh, new park. There just uh, just gives you a different idea of of what life was like back then. Even some uh, some other local attractions. This I believe is also an Aaron Veter. It may be somebody related to his uh, his studio. It's a little bit later, but uh, um, here's one of our our local attractions. Also probably from the uh, early 1880s. This is uh, an 1860s one, and perhaps one of the earliest ones of uh, Albany Rural Cemetery. Uh, Talisantha Lake. And this is before they packed up the lake and moved it out to Gilderland. <laughs> so, they used to have at least six lakes out there, but uh, um, uh, later, uh, I believe in the early 20th century, they were drained and uh, made into areas for more, uh, more internments. So, but imagine going out there in the 1860s uh, to, um, uh, to, to honor your relatives and you have this beautiful lake to, uh, to enjoy. Uh, ah, here's, uh, here's another um, uh, Haynes, uh, uh, Haynes photograph. Uh, and this is from 1870. Uh, James uh, Hurst had a, um, uh, had a free museum uh, in downtown Albany. Uh, and he sold these uh, stereo views. Uh, some of them were as much as 50 cents, which in 1870 was a heck of a lot of money to pay for something like this. But this is an early example of one of the other roles of stereo views of education. Schools ordered boxes and boxes of them and uh, used them to teach uh, geography, and in this case, natural history. Uh, he had a set of all the animals you could find, or most of the animals you could find, uh, living in, uh, in New York State. Uh, one wonders, though, uh, Haynes had to be pretty brave to get up that close to so many uh, cougars, and how he got them to stand still for the whole time of um, uh, taking the photograph uh, is, uh, is beyond me, but... Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> it comes up with a pretty good picture there. Another Albany photographer that I love uh, his his work, uh, Julius M. Went. Uh, he's actually later. He's uh, working in the uh, 1890s to 1915, which is after the golden age of photography. But uh, he seems to be doing it for a labor of love, not so much to make any money uh, out of it. Um, and he loved documenting people. Uh, this is an artist who has a couple of uh, uh, portraits in the Hall of uh, Governors, uh, Asa, uh, Asa Twitchell. Uh, Went had a habit of um, uh, somehow setting up his camera on city streets and jumping out and uh, ambushing people like the mayor as they walked by and publishing their, uh, publishing their photograph. Uh, he's a very interesting photographer. Uh, here's another one of, uh, that was sold by his, uh, his brothers. It's interesting that uh, this is 1874. Uh, the picture was, or was taken then, but uh, is being printed after 1885. And the reason you can tell it's after 1885 because he's also developing the newfangled Kodak film that you can take with your brownie camera and bring to, um, uh, bring to the uh, uh, photographer for developing. So uh, by this time, uh, 1885, this building uh, that you can barely see behind all this uh, snow, uh, the old New York State Capitol uh, is, uh, uh, is long gone. Let's see if we can... There we go. And that brings me, one of my, one of the reasons I got into this was to find interesting pictures of the New York State Capitol. Uh, and there are a lot of them out there. Some of them show rooms that are no longer there, different aspects of the building. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, one of the most common views that you'll find is this one, and it shows uh, the model that was built uh, and put on display to show how the Capitol was going to look. Of course, it never got to look like that, but <laughs> um, the picture was still very, uh, very popular uh, throughout the 18, uh, 1870s. It does show you what their, what their intent was, but uh, it sort of never got there. Uh, and uh, these uh, um, views by uh, Churchill, by um, Haynes, and uh, by uh, Veter, among others, uh, really show great documentation of what the building looked like when it was being constructed. You can see there's uh, the uh, sheds where they're uh, carving stone and carving the woodwork for the inside. The, the uh, front is not on the building. Uh, a lot of details that can be gained from, uh, uh, from tracking down these images. They're also extremely useful for restoration purposes. I talked with one of the architects who did the restoration of the uh, Senate chamber in the uh, 1970s and 1980s. And they took images like this and went over them with magnifying glasses to get all the details. Uh, they were counting and measuring uh, uh, the uh, pattern of the carpet among other things, so that they could, uh, could recreate them. So uh, part of the reason why the Senate chamber looks so much like it did in the 1880s has to do with the documentation that was recorded in these stereo views. Some things are no longer there. Uh, this is the uh, assembly chamber ceiling, which uh, uh, cracked and was removed in 1889 because some engineers uh, said that uh, it could uh, collapse and fall at any moment. Uh, so wisely, they, uh, they got rid of it. So, but uh, here, uh, um, uh, Aaron Veter uh, uh, is brave enough to point his camera straight up. as the only person ever to do that. So that's the only way you're going to see what that uh, highly vaunted assembly chamber looked like. And it is a beauty, if, if not. Uh, these uh, mural, or the mural, there's a set of murals, one on either side. This is the, uh, uh, called the Discoverer by uh, William Morris Hunt. Uh, and again, when that ceiling was taken out, uh, they uh, basically put a flat ceiling which covered up this mural and now it's deteriorated. So if you want to see what that mural looked like, you've got to find a stereo view. It's one of my favorites because this room also no longer exists and this is one of the few images of it 
the assembly library is where that fire of 1911 started. Mm -hmm. So this was all consumed in 19, uh, 1911 and uh, not replaced, uh, or at least anything, li anything like this. So somewhere in this room or, uh, were hidden all the booze that uh, the assembly uh, liked to partake in after their meetings, at least according to uh, one of the librarians. And uh, another bit of capital history before we move on to other topics. Uh, this is 1885, the sad day uh, Ulysses S. Grant's uh, body uh, has uh, laid in state overnight in the uh, State Street lobby of the Capitol uh, and is being uh, brought back down straight State Street to the train station for uh, the continuation of the journey to New York City. So. Now, stereo views can also prove the existence, uh, speaking of our capital hauntings, of ghosts in the capital. Uh, these two stereo views uh, show a very rare set of two ghosts here, and a very scary group of disembodied heads floating around in the uh, uh, center chamber. Absolute proof of ghosts, nothing to do with the fact that the Union Stereo View Company was actually a very poor <laughs> group of photographers and their cards are uh, pretty awful, most of them. So um, uh, they did not wait till people left the room before they took their photographs. Uh, another uh, building that's changed a lot, the executive uh, mansion. Um, it was uh, remodeled completely in the 18, uh, or in the 1880s. Uh, that postcard view shows a lot more like what it, what it, uh, what it does today, but uh, this is uh, after Samuel Tilden moved in and before David B. B. Hill remodeled it. So Now, I mentioned the golden age. Uh, toward the end of that golden age, a lot of companies like Kilbourne and Underwood and a variety of others began buying up all the smaller uh, operators, began mass producing the cards, driving everybody out of, uh, else out of business. And um, they made them a lot cheaper too. They uh, used uh, uh, inferior grades of cardboard. Uh, they used dry plate negatives, which were much more convenient, but uh, um, with much less resolution. Um, uh, used different papers, a bromide paper, so the quality of the cards drop precipitously. So this is sometimes referred to as the beige card period. And if you go to an antique store and you look in their box of stereo views and they're all this beige color, you might as well just not look because they're quite often they're really in terrible, uh, uh, you know, the images are just very hard to, hard to use, which is a, a, a terrible thing because these are actually very nice and interesting images of this uh, um, this train on this uh, crossing is a uh, a nice sort of a 19th century image and here's one where they actually caught the very moment when the angel came down to whisk away the soul of this uh, uh, this fallen soldier it's uh, amazing how they could possibly uh, possibly do that so um, a bit later, they started to get better, and you had kind of a second golden age period toward the end, very end of the 19th century, 1898 and beyond. Uh, they were still uh, consolidating. There were only a few companies left. Underwood and Underwood was one, uh, later uh, Keystone. Um, but uh, they were using better, uh, uh, better cards, better... Uh, um, uh, a better paper um, and uh, different types of images that are actually much, uh, much, much clearer. Um, these uh, uh, bay or gray or green cards that you see from the late 19th century often have very, uh, uh, very good, uh, uh, good images. Um, they're also often, you'll notice that they're curved if you're out there uh, uh, looking for them. Uh, when I first saw that, I thought, oh, this must have gotten damp and it must have worked in somebody's basement. But no, they actually uh, curved them for two reasons. One, so they would fit in the stereo view holders better. And two, they believed that it actually gave an enhancement to the, uh, to the uh, 3D effect. 
I love the way that they, whenever they take a vast prom promontory where you're up on top of things, uh, they can't just leave it at that. They have to put somebody in the picture <laughs> uh, uh, to uh, give you a sense of drama to worry that they're uh, so close to falling out off. At that time, of course, they still were using their stereo views in parlors, and they became more and more popular in schools. And again, this is how you found out about the world. This is how you learned what uh, Norway looked like. This is how you learned what the um, natives of Alaska looked like and how they, uh, how they lived. Um, this is how you would find out uh, oh, what it was like in places like China um, or Japan. Uh, they had literally hundreds of photographers that uh, were going throughout the world to uh, bring back uh, these pictures. The latest technology was a great um, uh, was, was a great subject uh, for these uh, pictures. We've already seen the railroad train. Um, balloons and aeronautics were uh, a popular, uh, a popular technology uh, from the day. This is a British uh, observation balloon uh, during the Boer War. Uh, and even some other uh, technologies that sadly haven't made it. Chicken power transportation. Uh, just think how, uh, how ecologically valuable that would be if instead of uh, internal combustion engines we had gone with chicken power, but sadly that uh, particular technology fell by the wayside. Pictures of all kinds of things were subjects for stereo views, so they did used uh, astronomy. Uh, they did color their stereo views sometimes, and some of the nicest ones actually have a tint or a color to them. Uh, but it was very difficult, and the cards were often more expensive because they had to be hand done, and the person had to get the two stereo views exactly the same. So it was very difficult to get a really good uh, tinted stereo view, but you can find them there. Uh, they're beautiful. They loved history. Um, here's the, um, um, oh, the um, uh, Native Americans of the Plains, uh, on, uh, pictures not uh, long after uh, their final defeats on the, on the Plains. Um, and uh, here is Teddy Roosevelt digging the Panama Canal. Uh, hard, to, hard, hard to figure how he uh, found time to do that with all the other things he was doing as president, but uh, uh, it looks like he's uh, hard at work there. So uh, one, of the, one of the things he's done. They love genre pictures of cute children, beautiful women, um, and of course uh, animals. Uh, so you'll find some really endearing pictures, uh, uh, especially in that late, uh, late 19th century. Uh, just on time. They also loved humor and puns. This one is referred to as four queens and a jack. Uh, social commentary made it into these uh, cards. Uh, here you have a little comment on dress reform and how hard it was to, for women to uh, dress the way they uh, believed they were supposed to. Uh, and you also have some commentary on uh, women's suffrage and uh, the, the new women. Well, this looks like a sexist card, and it probably was intended as such, but I read a, uh, uh, an article by a feminist historian about these, and she said that these cards, which were meant to be humorous, but they showed a woman in charge, um, kind of taking, uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, taking over and being very confident, they love them. So uh, suffragists and uh, um, uh, people interested in women's rights actually, even though it wasn't intended, uh, uh, became fans of cards like that. And of course, uh, humor could get out of hand a little bit. <laughs> um, this is a card that was uh, actually sold door to door, which is why it says sold by canvassers. I have no idea what the story is behind that and how she ended up losing her clothes and having to dress in apparel. And again, uh, 
cards do a great job of showing you what was in the minds of people, what they were thinking uh, back then. And this is a great example of the way people were thinking. This is from about 1900, uh, 1902, I guess. Um, hero worship has been innate in women ever from the times long ago when man's existence was a series of fights with wild beasts and savage foes, when his defeat meant perdition or slavery for his dear ones, and when his every safe return home was the occasion for thanksgiving and love's reward. It is her feminine instinct that drives Nellie into the arms of the bold warrior to rest her head blissfully on his manly bosom. Needless to say, the opinions expressed in this card are not those of your presenter, the Bethlehem Historical Society, or the Bethlehem Library. So, anyway. Now, the last really rest hurrah for stereo cards before they kind of precipitously dropped out of popularity was World War I. I could do two programs basically just on the cards of World War I, so I cut it down to just a few. Uh, these are two military units that are connected to our area, uh, both coming back in uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, 1919 uh, after the war, parading uh, through New York City. Uh, this is the um, uh, 30, I think the 37th uh, Division. Um, who uh, were made up of National Guard troops and many of the soldiers from our area were in that division, so a few from Albany would be somewhere in that parade. Um, and this is the famous 369th Regiment, uh, the Harlem Hellfighters, uh, which you may remember from Henry Johnson, who was the uh, sergeant who uh, uh, served in that, that particular African American regiment. I want to show you this card because sometimes you can find stories in these cards that are not in books. I've read dozens of books on World War I and I've never heard of this until I found it on a, uh, a uh, stereo view. And you may remember a few years ago there was a Wonder Woman movie that was set during World War I. Uh, well, this is the real Wonder Woman of World War I. Uh, uh, Mademoiselle Semmer. At the outbreak of the war, Mademoiselle Semmer was an orphan girl living in the little village of Ecclusiers. After the Allies were defeated at Charleroi, the French tried to make a stand on the Somme, but were obliged to retreat across a canal near her home. When the French had passed over the canal, the young girl raised the drawbridge and for fear of the pursuing Germans would compel her to give up the key without which it could not be lowered. Uh, she threw it into the canal. This held up the German for 24 hours. During the occupation of the village by the Germans, uh, Mademoiselle Summer concealed a number of French soldiers and aided them to escape, in which act she was finally caught by the Germans and sentenced to be shot. Just as she was placed before the firing squad, the French began to cannonade the village, and in the confusion, she escaped. For more than a year, she remained in her native village, helping the French soldiers whenever possible. Uh, she knew the locality so well, she sometimes acted as his guide through the marshes, and much of the time she was caring for the wounded. At last, her health broke down, and she was persuaded to go to Paris, where she entered a school for nurses in order that she might better aid the wounded soldiers. So I can imagine a, you know, a story like that. Uh, this is one of the few places where you can find interesting, uh, in interesting things um, uh, from, that, from that time period. The stereo views are very much uh, a place where you can go to, uh, uh, go to discover the past. And of course, they do have a role in the future. Most of us, of course, grew up with these um, uh, view masters. Um, there are all kinds of stereo photography never exactly went away and now it is uh, having a resurgence not just in the virtual reality that uh, every or a computer and your cell phones are now able to have but also uh, just because uh, just because it's cool. Has anybody um, uh, ever seen the movie Bohemian Rhapsody? about the band Queen. 
What does that have to do with stereo views? Well, the rock star Brian May, who's one of the founders of that band, I believe is the bass player in the band, is not only a rock star, he's also one of the premier uh, scholars of 19th century stereo photography. Uh, and uh, uh, he recently, uh, well, he actually has his own company, the London Stereoscopic Company. He sells uh, uh, modern-day stereo uh, view equipment. Uh, you can see that here, and there's an example over there. And not long ago, he and a, uh, another scholar wrote a book about a bucolic English village in the 1850s uh, they, uh, that had been recorded in a famous series of stereo views. And they went through and found uh, who all the people were, where the houses were, what they were doing, and wrote this book. Imagine a, uh, a uh, very famous rock star who's also, uh, in, uh, also an expert on 19th century stereo views. So you can see how stereo views have uh, once again come around and uh, uh, are cool once again. Which brings me to my final card, which uh, one of my favorites here, um, a nice or a young uh, farm couple on the old plow horse uh, is uh, uh, smirking a little bit about these uh, city dwellers who are trying to fix their broken down automobile. Uh, and the uh, caption is, the old time sparking plug is the best after all. So sometimes the old time technology is worth remembering, and worth bringing back because it can be uh, the best uh, after all. So thank you for, for listening. And this is definitely a hands-on exhibit. So I'd be glad for people to come up, look through the books. Uh, if you see a stereo view you'd like to take a little bit more, you can use the uh, stereo viewers to, uh, to uh, look at it. Uh, so feel free to take a look. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, anybody? Is, oh. Oh. Yes, most of the time. You, uh, there were other techniques, especially very early before those cameras were readily available. Uh, you can, and that you still can today, because people are, are able to, you can uh, basically just take two cameras and hold them a, a, apart. It's difficult. It's difficult with the two cameras or with one camera moved from one place to another. Uh, it's difficult, but it can be done to get a uh, uh, get a, a stereo uh, stereo photograph that way. But the, it's it's generally a special uh, uh, special camera. Uh, the um, gentleman uh, in the uh, opening picture. Oh, there we go. Um, you can see he's actually got a specialized stereo view camera. And that's that's why he's out there. <laughs> Uh, uh, on top of a skyscraper to uh, to get a picture. So uh, you do see um, uh, you, uh, they do show up sometimes in the pictures. Yeah, um, yeah. This is a, a modern day version of it, a, a vintage, but uh, it's a uh, 35 millimeter. In this story that you can. When you get time to figure it out, I'm going to try and take some pictures. <laughs> Yeah, there's, it's still out there and, and, and still available. There are, uh, are all kinds of different techniques being developed now. Uh, I think you can, uh, there are apps for cell phones that you can actually take stereo view of your pictures now. So it's really uh, getting a renaissance there. Yeah. Are you aware of any stereo views of like that? I'm not, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I found some the other day at Rensselaerville. Um, and of course they have the one of Indian uh, Ladder Farms. Um, there, I haven't really looked for them, but there, there could be. Uh, I went to uh, Aaron Dieter traveled around. Um, uh, there were other uh, stereo photographers. Um, probably it would be from that earlier golden period because uh, um, 
the later ones, they were more interested in, in exotic, uh, exotic locales. So unless you had a huge, famous thing like Niagara Falls in your community, you might, you might not have been taken at that point. But you never know. I, I would keep, that, keep an eye out and you'll find something. Um, any other? Oh, yeah. There are stereoscope photographs that are on glass slides, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So is that still stereoscope? Like a lot of what I see up here, they're on, on paper and you're yeah. looking at them. Uh, viewer, but in some cases, what you might see, uh, if you find something like that, might be the uh, light, uh, uh, negative for taking for printing the stereo view. But uh, earlier in the period, before these uh, the, uh, the printed cards uh, were uh, uh, were easy to find, uh, some of the very earliest uh, stereo views were on uh, were on glass cards. So when you find them. I believe there was a company in Philadelphia that was famous for that in the 1850s. So uh, usually uh, the glass ones are actually very, very early. Uh, and they, they work yeah, much better in, in, in one of these, the uh, Brewster story, and, and a lot of people try this. Uh, this has a tissue card in it, but you have a glass one and the light comes from the back and you really gives you good, uh, good food in it. So, uh, so yeah, the glass ones are, and they're a bit more valuable than the paper ones because they're, uh, they're rarer and rarer in part because of the first they're uh, delicate. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, glass areas are very important. I noticed in a lot of your views, one view was darker and sharper than the other. Yeah, um, I think a lot depends on uh, uh, the um, quality of the card there. Uh, especially the ones from the mid 1880s, say 1890s, were often terrible. Uh, so quite often, uh, you know, there are some wonderful cards, some great uh, condition ones, but there are also a lot of really poorly, poorly made ones. So, um, um, so that may be um, uh, maybe part of that. Uh, these all look pretty good, although I think you can a little bit on the one that's on the left there. They, there are lots of different ones. These, like this one, is a lithographed or printed card, uh, which were really, really cheap around 1900. Uh, they're nice and colorful, but they don't give a really good 3D because they're, uh, they're flat, uh, flat uh, They're fun to collect and they're very inexpensive to buy. Uh, and sometimes they have good subjects, but uh, they really weren't uh, weren't up to the quality of some of the golden era ones. There, Let's see if we can get. Now here's a, a, a good example. And well, actually, you do see that there's a little bit of uh, one's a little more dark than the other. This is you know Beerstadt is a very good uh, good photographer, uh, but they are a little just a little bit different. Uh, a little bit different perspective, so that we get that uh, get that 3D uh, 3D effect. Uh, yeah. Occasionally, I come across uh, one of these stereo views where they put the exact same image in both, mm -hmm. so you don't get that 3D effect. Yeah. 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 Is that just an unscrupulous uh, uh, company? Probably, or a mistake. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I got one where. Uh, Half the cart, or uh, there's uh, uh, half the image on one side is missing, basically. Uh, so it's, yeah. there, there were good companies and some uh, really bad companies because they were so popular, everybody wanted to get in, uh, in on the action. So, uh, so there were some really cheap ones and, and some really, uh, uh, really good quality uh, ones. Uh, you can go. Uh, if you go to an antique stores, you can go coming to boxes of uh, sometimes two dollars, sometimes one dollar. <laughs> and you, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get started in the collection, but if it takes off to be close. <laughs> there's a question. Are, are the two images exactly the same? No, is there a they're um, they're almost the same, but if they were exactly the same, you're not going to get the same uh, stereo view. They're a slightly different 
uh, image. Right? Is that hard to tell? Yeah, yeah. But they're they're coming just like the just like your eyes are giving you a slightly different image, but it mixes together when you look at them uh, through two different lenses. You can see how there's a uh, this kind of keeps your uh, eyes separated yeah. until you sell it. Uh, so it makes it into makes it into that uh, that three D three D effect. So. And yeah, the good ones are uh, are less slightly different. Not so you really notice, but yeah. if you were you know, really examining them, I'm looking at this one, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the road is just slightly different angle, and so forth. So this one by, uh, I think by meter, probably uh, a good, uh, pretty good image. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned, you know, Sunday afternoon, people looking at these pictures. Did this evolve into, you know, like clubs or a group of people? Like you, you know, you would look through your 100 cards. And yeah. You're not going to look through them every Sunday afternoon. Would people kind of trade them, or was there oh, that kind of activity? Do you think? You know, I don't. I would never say never because if I say I'm not going to do that tomorrow, I'll find another one. I haven't seen any okay. mention of that in, in this sort of times. Okay. Uh, that you, you had your friends over to look at them. You know, when you came back from the Falls, you invited everybody to come and look at, at your pictures. Um, and you, um, you know, purchased these, later on you purchased these scenes to set them. Uh, they're, um, I have seen reference, there's quite a few stereo collector clubs today that do something like that and buy some and trade or write articles about it. Um, it seems like that it's something that could happen, certainly could happen, but um, I have I have not yet to come across a across a reference for that. So research is for that. Write it out one day. <laughs> yeah. It's the magnification stereoscopes the same, but you can adjust them. So yeah. So are they all making the same magnification? I believe so. Uh, there are a lot of different ones. Sometimes they're building the furniture. Uh, there are some uh, very fancy uh, ones that I think might have had a better, had a different education and were very expensive. Um, so maybe some of those real, um, you know, the, uh, the high-end ones uh, might have had, to, had a different magnification. But basically, the home space scope, this is what you see is what you get. Very simple, everyday, functional, and uh, uh, inexpensive. Flooded the, flooded the world with the uh, and expensive property. And once again, feel free to come up, take a close look. I don't mind if people handle the survey, just look at the, um, uh, the uh, 